Let us pray. Dear God, as you touched this earth through the hands and feet of Jesus, so now touch our lives with the truth of your word. Amen. The first Easter day was a very long day. At least that's the case in the gospel according to Luke. Chapter 24 begins with the women going to the tomb at early dawn that morning. The stone is rolled back and two men in dazzling clothes announce that Jesus has been raised. The women hurry back to tell the disciples what happened, but their report is received as an unbelievable idle tale. Still, Peter runs to the tomb to see if it's really empty. Luke says on that same day, two of Jesus' followers are making their way to Emmaus when Jesus joins them, but they don't recognize him. They talk to this stranger about their disappointment that Jesus wasn't the one to redeem Israel. But then Jesus explains to them how everything that has happened is necessary according to Scripture. And when they all sit down to eat, Jesus blesses and breaks the bread and that's when the two recognize him. And evidently, just like that, he vanishes from their sight. My hunch is that the two left food on the table in their rush to get back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples about their experience. And that's where we pick up the story in this morning's passage. Reading from the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning with the last part of the 36th verse. <clears throat> Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a few years ago, Charles Hubbard found himself in quite the predicament. The Texas resident and Navy veteran received a letter from the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs informing him that he was dead. Not only was he dead, his family was obligated to pay back over $5,000 in benefits that had been sent after his death. So the backstory was that someone had stolen Charles's identity and used it to receive treatment at a hospital in California. And after the imposter died, Charles received a bill of nearly $300,000 from that California hospital for the treatment and the subsequent letter from the VA. So Charles contacted the VA and made an extensive case for being very much alive, hoping that they would quickly restore his $1,000 a month pension benefit. But the VA said it would take up to eight months for him to be officially brought back to life. So Charles relied on a substantial reduction in rent from his landlord who could see him and on food from his church's food pantry to sustain him over those months until he was fully restored to life, complete with pension benefits. It appears that the resurrected Christ has his own challenges when it comes to convincing his disciples that he's very much alive. Luke indicates that all of a sudden he's standing among them where they are gathered. 
peace be with you, he says. Well, they're familiar words from Jesus. He had said them just a handful of days earlier at their last meal together before the crucifixion. Luke doesn't include it, but I bet there's this collective, ah, in the room as the disciples jump in surprise at his presence and his voice. But his voice isn't enough to convince them that it's him. They think he's a ghost, and rightly so. They had seen him die. That's when Jesus sets about proving that it really is him, fully in the flesh. Here, look at my hands and my feet. It's okay to touch me, he says, working to undo that parent's oft-repeated admonition, look, but don't touch. Or like the dog owner trying to convince a scared child this thing with four legs and sharp teeth really won't bite. One of the proven tests back then to determine whether a ghost was really a ghost was to check their hands and feet for two reasons. First, doing so would provide evidence of bones, which ghosts did not have. And second, a ghost was not capable of having feet that touched the ground. But apparently, the disciples are still not convinced. As one commentator puts it, the tomb is open, but their minds are closed. So Jesus turns to a fresh tactic. What's for supper? Have you anything here to eat? They hand him a piece of fish, and he eats it. And Luke uses great specificity at this point. It's not just fish, it's broiled fish. The only thing missing is the wedge of lemon on the side. It's after Jesus cleans his plate that the disciples are apparently convinced that this really is indeed Jesus, every last ounce of him. As Peter Marty writes, not a ghouly or ghosty at all, God is at home in the flesh, wearing everything from bones and nerve endings to taste buds and a, a digestive tract. And once he's convinced the disciples that it really is him, Jesus begins a review of the scriptures about him. The review most likely includes teachings he had shared with them before his death, back when the bulk of what he said had sailed right over their heads. But now they are all ears, and Jesus is helping them connect the dots. Luke writes that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The Greek verb, verb for opened is the same one Luke uses in the Emmaus story, when Jesus broke bread and the eyes of those with him were opened and they recognized him. What Jesus tells the disciples helps them understand him and what he's been about for the last three years, namely that his life and his death and in particular his resurrection bring to fruition God's plans and purpose for them and for the whole world. So here's a question for you, actually more than one. Why do you suppose Luke wrote this last chapter of his gospel the way he did? Why not just one resurrection appearance? Why three? Why go to such detail about broiled fish to prove that Jesus has been raised and was fully alive? And maybe the biggest question of all, so what? What does that matter to us some 2,000 years later? Well, perhaps Luke wrote this chapter to counter the prevailing thought back then that the body and the spirit were separated and that the spirit held much more importance than the body. Or perhaps, and more likely, Luke wrote what he did to encourage his readers who probably needed as much encouragement as they could get. Luke's gospel dates to the year 85. The temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed a few years earlier, and that temple had been more than just a building to the Jews. To them, it was the dwelling place, the sacred center of the Most High. So when the temple fell, the branch of Judaism connected to it fell as well. Jewish and Gentile Christians, on the other hand, had found their sacred center not in a building, but in the life and person of Jesus. And so when Jesus was crucified, it caused their spirits to crumble into pieces. Those who had first centered their relationship in a building 
And then in a person, we're left with neither one. What now? They ask, what do we do? Where do we turn? Luke wanted those despondent readers to know that Jesus was really and truly alive. Yes, mysterious and not quite the same as before, but alive nonetheless. Thus the emphasis on having the disciples touch Jesus' hands and feet and having Jesus eat a piece of fish. Luke wanted that new community of faith to hold on to the reality of the resurrection and to do their part, just like the disciples, in helping the gospel make its way to the ends of the earth. For Luke, it wasn't just about looking into the past. It was about looking ahead into the future. You are witnesses of these things, he writes. And now for that biggest question of all. So what? What does it matter to us that Jesus held out his hands and his feet and ate fish? Barbara Brown Taylor offers one of the best perspectives on this. She writes, hands and feet are simply not the first things we notice about one another, and yet they're so telling of who we are. She says, my hands are freckled like my mother's and my grandmother's. I have a callus on my right hand from all the writing I do, and a middle finger that has never been the same since a Tennessee walking horse pulled it out of joint. Look at my hands and feet, Jesus said. And when they did, the disciples saw everything that he had ever said to them. They saw the hands that had broken bread and blessed fish, holding it out to them over and over again. They saw the hands that reached out to touch a leper without pausing or holding back. And they saw his feet, the ones that had carried him hundreds of miles, taking his good news to all who were starving for it. They were wounded now, the hands that had joined him to other people, the feet that had joined him to the earth. He left us something to recognize him by, his hands and feet, just like ours, or almost like ours. And then she says this, you know what Jesus' hands and feet said about him. What do ours say about us? Where have they been? Whom have they touched? How have they served? What have they proclaimed? You are witnesses of these things, Jesus said to the disciples, and he says the very same thing to us. Live the resurrection story. Live it with your hands and your feet, whether it's cupping clean water in Belize or putting food into backpacks for children or serving hungry folks at the welcome table or sewing the binding onto a quilt or visiting those who are incarcerated or signing a card for a homebound member or digging in the dirt in the community garden or giving a ride to someone or spreading mulch onto a flower bed or coming to this table. We celebrate the risen Christ anew each time we share this meal. Here we are fed and nourished so that we in turn can go into the world to feed others. In the words of Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.